I am. So I promise to uh, at least show one case from uh, beginning to end and uh, show how we applied game design for, uh, to create a behavioral change. Uh, this one's geared specifically towards uh, adults. Um, for, for the gentleman ju that just asked that particular question. Um, uh, first, I'll have a brief look at game mechanics and dynamics, our toolkit, so to say, uh, that help us to reinforce behavioral change through play. So, game design uh, and video games are basically uh, based off uh, two different uh, uh, types of game elements. On the one hand, we have dynamics, on the other hand, we have a mechanic. Uh, and dynamics and mechanics influence each other. So you can ba basically mix and match those to uh, elicit certain behavior. Now, a reward is a, a dynamic. Uh, progression is a dynamic. Uh, competition, obviously, and uh, cooperation uh, are also dynamics. If you choose to create a game that is competitive in nature, you will have people vying for uh, a first place, for instance, in a race. In a, uh, uh, if we, we take a, a video game such as Wipeout. I don't know if you know that particular game, a very good game, originally designed by Psygnosis for the PlayStation 1. And obviously, there are now uh, numerous uh, sequels, the latest one being a PlayStation VR version, which is extremely cool. Um, and it's a very competitive thing. It's a competitive race and uh, basically you have to be faster than your competitor but you also have to memorize the tracks to be able to steer through them completely and that requires anticipation. Uh, so, so if you've learned the track then you're able to anticipate when a certain corner comes within the racing track you know when to steer in a certain direction. Um, we have a dynamic which is rank, status, which ties directly into competition but can be something uh, uh, apart from competition as well. Uh, rank is a status that works within uh, uh, a competitive game but it also works uh, within a game that is not directly competitive such as Pac-Man that I showed earlier. Uh, when you're vying for a high score you're competing with someone that you do not know. Uh, but you, uh, the better you play, the more status you acquire. The same thing is true for a game such as World of Warcraft, or if we look at uh, uh, um, arena brawlers that nowadays are very popular, such as Fortnite, it becomes a matter of becoming better at a game than being rewarded. And you can be rewarded in points, but you can also be rewarded in, for instance, virtual goods. So there can be a connection be rewar between reward and virtual goods and between rewards and points as well. So these are just some examples from dynamics and mecha mechanics. And the best games are games that are easy to play but hard to master, which is something that stems from the old arcade games that I referenced earlier. Um, and if we look at one particular game, one of my favorites is Tetris. Probably everyone knows this particular game. So I think this is uh, one of the best puzzle games there is. It is very simple to play because there's, there are only two particular things that you can do. You can move a brick with your joystick from left to right when it falls down. Uh, oh, sorry. When it falls down, you can move it from left to right to make it fit in one of these gaps. And there's a button that will allow you to turn, uh, rotate your particular block to make it fit better. And the goal of the game is to make sure that you form complete lines. And when you form the complete line, you get some points and the line disappears. But if you actually destroy four lines in a row, uh, a complete block of four lines, you create what they call a tetramino and then that particular bit falls down and uh, it will go up into your score. When you move, when you progress, the game becomes faster and faster, uh, demanding more and more agility. But one of the best features that's in there is there's a time limit 
the time limit will force you to do all this within a certain time frame. So that's an added game rule, an added mechanic that uh, forces you to, uh, to make your decisions. And then there's this one, next. Next is anticipation. Basically, only a player who has become master, has become extremely skillful in playing the game, is able to look forward. It's like playing chess. If you know how to play, if you know the game rules, if you know chess, you know that it's very important to think ahead. You have to think ahead of your opponent. You have to think several moves ahead if you're able to, which is incredibly complex because there are so many ways that a game can evolve. And Tetris does a very similar thing. So it's quite easy to rotate those blocks and to let them drop down and to clear one line, but it is much harder to actually complete a row of four different blocks um, and by anticipating what next block you can use, especially when the speed picks up. So we have all these things working in tandem to create a more complex game, while the, the game rules itself make it uh, essentially a very uh, simple game. So game loops uh, work very well. This is a, a game loop from a game called Pokemon Go. You probably know it. The reason why Pokemon Go is so successful is because it has a very good and simple game loop uh, uh, such as most great games have. So we start here in the top right corner where you explore physically, in real you walk in real life, you use your phone to look through augmented reality for creatures that are uh, hidden uh, on the, the game map. And uh, you have an encounter with uh, one of these creatures. That encounter is important because you have to capture this particular creature. Catch, capturing them, you can, you can do that by being aided by uh, utilizing Pokeballs. And this costs you, and what you gain are four different parts of an in-game economy. We have Stardust, we have Candy, and we have Pokemon that we can use to, uh, to help us in a capture. Then once we've successfully collected, uh, captured, we collect different things and then we're allowed to level up. When we level up, we are added Pokeballs and items. When we upgrade our Pokemon to aid us in the capture with these encounters, we lose these parts of this in-game economy that we gain here. As you can see, this becomes a loop, a core loop. There are other loops within Pokemon that make it successful, but these are the core loops that are, uh, make it into a grind. You've probably heard this term before. If you look at World of Warcraft and other massive multiplayer online role-playing games, uh, Diablo, which is arguably not an MMO, but uh, at least an, a, a multiplayer game that's also uh, focusing heavy on grinding, it becomes apparent that when you redo a certain action in a game and you are rewarded, and that reward is then basically placed into play to make you able to continue doing that same thing on a higher level, we speak of a grind. So it's something that you keep doing, it's rinsing and repeating. But it's a system that works very well. We know from science that if we do something repetitively, we become better at it. You probably know that if you spend 10,000 hours of doing one certain thing, you will eventually become a master in that particular thing. Uh, so honing your skills is only possible through, um, through repetition. But repetition becomes boring real quick. So it is important to create something that is, even when it's boring, you make sure that you manage to make it attractive and appealing by uh, bolting on certain other dynamics and mechanics that obfuse uh, uh, the boring part of what it is that you would like to do. Here I'm going to use my example, surgery training. This is a game that we designed that I specifically left out of my initial presentation. Uh, and it's uh, training people in the basic skills for laparoscopy. Laparoscopic surgery or laparoscopy is uh, a procedure, 
uh, in surgery that is used to remove, uh, for instance, a gallbladder in a cholecystectomy. Uh, for this particular uh, game, we worked together with, initially with two different hospitals, U University Medical Center of Groningen and the Medical Center in Leeuwarden. That was the initial part. We formed a new company called Cutting Edge. None of the shareholders understood that. But, uh, or they understood the, 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 the reason why we needed a different company to do it, but um, we needed a name for the company. And as game designers, uh, we tend to be frolicking, so we said, you know what, we're creating a, a surgery training company, let's call it Scalpel Software, cutting edge of technology. And none of the people in the suits understood, and they said, yeah, cutting edge, sounds good. Cutting edge, cutting edge. They never got it. But so we started this new company uh, and we looked at uh, laparoscopy. There's a reason why we uh, were creating this particular game. This is laparoscopic surgery or laparoscopy. As you can see, it's quite different from open surgery. So normally, here's your gallbladder. Sometimes it becomes uh, very irritable and uh, basically you can live without it if you uh, monitor your fat levels, the fat levels of the the greasiness of the food that you eat, etc. Uh, and we can take it out with normal uh, cholecystectomy, uh, open surgery. Basically, they made a large gash from here to there. The surgeon actually looks inside the patient and sees the gallbladder, removes it, cuts it out, and they sew you back up. Uh, but there's a problem because obviously when you cut through the abdominal section, uh, you also cut through a lot of muscles. So you need a lot of rehabilitation, you need to train it. It takes a very long time to, to heal that, which is uh, very problematic. And with laparoscopy, laparoscopy, you don't have that problem because what they do is they create three small punctures, two on the side of your abdominal section and one small puncture underneath your belly button, underneath your navel, and they insert uh, a camera uh, underneath the navel and two instruments to the side. Uh, so you only have three very small holes and they're, they're able to take that uh, gallbladder out and basically you can be uh, uh, back in shape in three weeks time. You can be on the beach in your bikini or trousers in three weeks time, no problem. So it has a lot of benefit, but it also has a lot of problems. What you can see is that laparoscopy also has a lot of things in common with video games. You see that the surgeon's actually looking at a screen instead of into the patient. He has controllers in his hands while he's looking at a screen. These are all things that you need to train. Um, sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, does anyone have a problem with bloody videos? You can look the other way. Okay, so the important thing to notice, I'll, I'll, I won't turn it on immediately. You can look away. So this is not as bloody. Uh, but here you can see what the surgeon's doing. This is an axial cholecystectomy. Uh, you can see that the surgeon is doing all the work with his hands and you can see him cutting out the gallbladder here. I'm gonna let it run for a second. You don't have to watch, but if you do watch, please look at the surrounding areas and try to discern what's what. You will see that that becomes rather difficult. There it goes, cutting it out. And this is what the surgeon's actually seeing. And that's what he's actually doing. And finally, there it goes, and uh, it's out the window. Sorry about that, but at least it gives you an idea on uh, what it is we're talking about. So there are five basic skills that you need to learn for laparoscopy. Uh, there's an inverse movement uh, because we have instruments inserted in the abdominal section of the uh, body. Basically, if my hand is the, the belly, you, we blow up the belly with CO2 gas and your belly is extremely flexible. Um, so the instrument goes in 
but you can imagine that when you move the instrument to the left, the tips move of the instrument moves to the right. When you move to the right, it moves to the left, up becomes down, and down becomes up. Obviously, this is something that you need to train because this is not innate in how we operate. The second thing is depth perception. What you saw in that video is that you have no shadows. And there's a very simple reason for it because the camera lens that goes in underneath your belly button also houses the light source, which means that the light source is aimed directly at that particular thing that you're operating on, which means that the shadows cast directly behind it, so you see no shadows. Now, normally, in the normal world, if I were to grab this bottle, I'm able, through my shadows, to see how close I am to a certain object. And you can imagine, if you do these with these tooltips and you don't see any shadows, it becomes a problem. Because, uh, for instance, with coagulation, when one of the tools becomes very hot, you might accidentally hit a liver instead of trying to uh, 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 grab out a gallbladder. So that creates uh, a lot of collateral damage. So you really need to know and need to tr train how deep that particular instrument has gone in. So the same is for working on the dimly lit conditions, so you don't have a lot of light, so it becomes hard to discern things. We need to train both the passive and the active hand. So if you're writing with your right hand, you know how difficult it is to write with your left hand. Now imagine not writing with your left hand, but having to use your left hand to do a uh, surgical procedure for roughly 45 minutes. That's about as long as a cholecystectomy takes, 45 minutes. So that left hand needs to, for instance, keep something out of the way of your active hand whilst, whilst it is cutting or uh, doing uh, these things. And then obviously we have eye-hand coordination. So these five skills are something that surgeons need to train. Uh, and normally we do that on simulators. This is one of those simulators. This is an expensive one. This one uh, costs roughly 80,000 euros. They come in all shapes and sizes. The most inexpensive one is roughly 3,500 euros. And the most expensive one is roughly 500,000 euros. <coughs> they do training very well. They have uh, 3D models of gallbladders, et cetera, et cetera. To us, they look extremely realistic. There's a lot of evidence uh, that when you train a lot with uh, uh, these uh, simulators, you will become a better surgeon. You will become better at basic laparoscopic skills. So there's a lot of proof there. So what uh, they decided was that uh, they wanted to have skill centers. This is the skill center at the University Medical Center in Groningen. And uh, it houses, it cost them a couple of million. It houses uh, for a fortune in uh, simulators and they expected it to be very busy and very uh, well um <coughs> visited by residents and surgeons alike. Because it's not just that you need to train these basic skills, it's you, you need to keep training them, th those skills to bl uh, stay effective. But this is the sad truth. So after all that money being spent, after all that academic uh, proof that training those skills is beneficial, nobody is using these simulators. So the people who ran the skill center and ran the educational program thought, why not? Well, one of the reasons was it's, they're not often available. The other reason is uh, residents and surgeons don't have a lot of time. They need to go to the skills lab to train them with them. And the other one is that they break down a lot. They're often out of order. But the real reason turned out to be they're really, really boring. Now, the boring part is uh, because uh, when you do training a lot, uh, these simulators become very uh, easily, uh, um, how do you say this? You can guess what's coming next. They become very predictable. And the other problem is that most people tend to like surprises. None of them are there. Then there is the added uh, detractor that if you've actually, if you've done simulation on these very expensive simulators in the beginning, uh, they look very realistic. But if you've then worked on something physically, like for instance a pig, 
you've removed the gallbladder on a pig station, which is a, a, a real pig, then you don't find that, uh, those simulators that immersive anymore. Because in reality, even though they look the part, even though to us as laymen, that gallbladder, that 3D model of that gallbladder looks like an actual gallbladder, and it, li it looks like it moves like an actual ball gallbladder, um, they really don't. After you've worked on a, a pig, you see the differences and you think it feels like a snooker uh, cue and a cue ball. Then there's the difference of intrinsic motivation. So here we have a video to the left of a guy who's very good at ironing his shirt. Extremely good. I mean, I wish I could do it like that. And um, this is uh, a manual task. The same as throwing a ball. To the right is a kid that's throwing a ball. That kid will keep throwing that ball through that hoop until infinity because he likes to throw that particular ball. But the same kind of manual task, namely ironing a shirt, you've never seen someone ironing their shirts and at the end of after having done that entire pile, picking up the pile, throwing it up, and starting all over again. So there is a difference between this manual task and that particular ball. Now playing with that ball is also unpredictable because you don't know whether it's going to fall in that, through that hoop no matter how good you are. You cannot predict for a full 100% that it's actually going through that loop. Um, but the kid to the right doesn't need any intrinsic motiv motivation. Uh, uh, extrinsic motivation because he's already intrinsically motivated. The guy to the left probably just needs to iron his shirts because he needs to show up uh, at the office or whatever. So there are two ways to motivate surgeons to do training. One is the stick method, beating them in submission, and the other is the carrot method, dangling something in front of them. So intrinsic through extrinsic motivation. What would you like to have when you're training your surgeons, when you're uh, giving them uh, the opportunity to train? Would you like to train them through extrinsic motivation? Or would you like them to become so engrossed within the subject matter that they start doing it themselves? The latter, right? Because if you don't have to promote it, and they keep doing it themselves, we ensure ourselves that our surgeons are becoming really, really good surgeons. So the carrot method is something that is more... Uh, so oh, sorry. So we decided to, uh, like my colleague was saying, we decided to uh, uh, design a game because that a game has certain mechanics in there and dynamics that reinforce that intrinsic motivation. So we decided to create a game that uh, is unpredictable, that is Im Im immersive, and it also appeals to surgeons' uh, emphasis on liking to play with toys. Surgeons are really, really, they really like toys, and they're extremely competitive. I left, left that out of here, but surgeons are also an extremely competitive target audience. So in order to ac accommodate all those different things, we decided to design a game, and that game focuses on te technical skills and not on procedural skills. So. When, once we had that realization that we need them to learn these five basic tasks, but it doesn't matter where or how we're going to train those skills. We don't have to have an actual gallbladder in there. We just want them to be able to move in a certain way. We want them to do those five, train those five skills. So we started working with Nintendo, specifically for the Nintendo Wii U, uh, because that had a lot of benefits that uh, those simulators didn't. Uh, the Wii U is an inexpensive, consumer-grade electronical device. It's a video game device. It's nigh unbreakable. It also has infrared sensing that the Nintendo Wii also had, the N Nintendo Wii Remote. And with infrared sensing, we will be able to do depth sensing and other uh, things that are very much uh, important for our game design because we need to train those five skills. So we created a controller like this together with Nintendo of Japan uh, that very much uh, looks like a laparoscopic instrument. Uh, it 
Wii Remote that we all know from bowling in our living room. Um, and it utilizes the Nintendo nunchuck to create an analog grip, similar to what actual laparoscopic instruments have. And it was our goal to create something that is really inexpensive, that is fun to play, that residents can actually take home, that surgeons can take home, that they can just connect to their TV set instead of having to go to this very expensive skills lab. Uh, and by creating something that is extremely inexpensive, we uh, thought we could do a very good game design as well. So this is an actual laparoscopic instrument. As you can see, it has a very high um, visual correlation between the real instrument and uh, what we designed for it. Now you can argue that this bit on top isn't there in real life and this also has added weight, but we negated that with this particular design construct. Now the Nintendo Wii U, uh, the Nintendo Wii had a sensor bar. The problem with the sensor bar was that it only had two infrared sensors and it would triangulate between a uh, Wii remote and those two sensors, but by creating this particular play field, we had um, uh, the problem that it would obfuse one of the sensors uh, every, uh, every time. So we actually created a new um, sensing field with uh, four infrared sensors, so we could always ha triangulate the, the signal. And we created a game that has nothing to do with uh, laparoscopy from uh, the, if you look at the game, it doesn't appear to have anything uh, in common with uh, laparoscopic surgery, but in fact it does. It's a game about a small girl that uh, lives on an alien planet together with her father, and uh, her father runs a mining colony with a lot of these uh, robots, and um, she likes to play with the robots, and uh, her father tells her that she needs to do her homework, and eventually uh, he gives her uh, a butler droid called Swank. And Swank is supposed to help her with her homework, but she loves to dance the tango. And so does Swank. So they s practice tango all the time. And uh, her father uh, notices, he finds out, and he sends the small robot back to the, down the mine shaft. And uh, the girl follows the robot and runs into trouble and you actually control the butler droid and you have to save the little girl. And in the process you have to save all these other robots from uh, the underground world and the dangers it harbors. Now, if we look at it, a trailer of this particular video game. Oh, sorry. Something's not working right, but... probably the sexiest trailer ever made for a surgical training device. <laughs> so it was available on a Nintendo eShop. It only cost 20 bucks, which is a major departure from uh, uh, training tools that cost uh, thousands up to tens of thousands of uh, training tools. And as you can see, it doesn't remotely resemble laparoscopy. But the game design itself very much does. What we see here is the first person view of Swank's vehicle, is a motor uh, uh, vehicle, and it's a bit dark because that's the way it should be, um, but uh, if we can dim the lights then we can probably see uh, uh, a bit more. Let's see.
but you can see that we have two arms. There's uh, not a lot of uh, brightness. There's uh, a lot of color. There's a lot of lights, but there's no depth. And every uh, bonus or every level in terms of layout is as big as an abdominal section. So the actual amounts of uh, space that you travel with your instruments is just as big as an abdominal cavity. Uh, you can also see that uh, you need to save these robots and so on and so forth. There are also obstacles, there are icicles, there are stalactites and so on, uh, which you don't want to nudge accidentally because that creates collateral damage. A bridge can fall down. You can, and this is the very first level, so this, this is very simple. Here you just use welders, which is actually a coagulation tool, uh, to melt the ice blocks where the robots are stuck in. And you have to guide them in every level to an exit. The gameplay is very much akin to Pikmin, uh, a game that I really like that was uh, designed by Shigeru Miyamoto. Uh, and uh, it also has references to The Incredible Machine, a game that I really liked where you get to learn how to build stuff, which is also in our game. You have to build all these bridges and uh, you have to save a certain amount of robots. There are also certain bonus elements that you can pick up, but only if you've truly mastered it. There are all these weird uh, plants that you need to fight, like tongues that lash out that try to catch your robots. You have to grab them with one hand, your active hand, and then cut them off with your passive hand. So it trains all these things, but it also has boss fights. It has an orchestral soundtrack, and during a boss fight, it will train you or it will test you uh, all your uh, skills. And the goal that we set for ourselves was to reach the gold standard. The gold standard in uh, laparoscopic surgery uh, tests is the FLS test. The FLS test is an abbreviation for the Fundamentals for Laparoscopic Surgery. It's a mandatory test that you need to take before you've proven that you are uh, really good with these instruments. And our goal was create a game that crunches that entire curriculum in 15 hours of gameplay with boss fights that uh, allow for you to, uh, to test the, these things. And if you finish the game, you should be able to successfully complete the FLS test. And that's basically what we did. Ah, that worked a little bit. Well, thank you. Thank you for the effort. So uh, we designed uh, all this uh, in conjunction with a, a large group of uh, uh, surgeons and residents from around the world. And uh, the game was released a couple of years ago. We had a very extensive validation trajectory where we, um, here on the right side, you can see a training kit. On the left side, you can see the original FLS test. We specifically designed goals for that. This was a preliminary prototype. And we matched those up. This was our, uh, the construct validity of the controller. And here you can see, this was a, a very initial test, but it showed already a lot of promise, that uh, the novices, which are the red dots, and the experts playing the game. So experts were people that uh, uh, had done more than 40 actual laparoscopic procedure, and the novices were people that uh, hadn't or had only done up to five. And what you can see is that the people that are really good at the game uh, are really good at surgery, also really good at the game. And the majority of novices, not so much, except for this one. This guy did internal medicine. We told him you should switch careers. He did. So, uh, yeah. And uh, here you can see the face validity which is not that interesting, but at least it shows a, a couple of things. So uh, it was uh, very positive in terms of the instruments. And um, here you see it as a training tool, which scored very high, except for anatomy, which is uh, true because we have no anatomy in the game. So. Uh, those were our uh, initial test results. Uh, this was then uh, repeated by Stanford and uh, by a couple of other universities. Now uh, roughly 40 different uh, um, universities have tested it. 
and uh, the results are available through our website. Most of them are um, peer-reviewed and uh, have been uh, published in journals such as the American Journal for Surgery, National Endoscopy, and, uh, and things like that. And it's been a, a big success. And this is, I think, true. for surgery training, uh, the very least. And um, the cool thing is this, this was our initial project, so it, we moved away from that. I'm not, since the camera is on, I, uh, I cannot say certain names, but we work for uh, a couple of companies, specifically in robotic surgery, where we've uh, basically uh, rehearsed and uh, uh, repeated uh, this uh, success. Uh, for robotic surgery, and we've also done it for different forms of uh, surgery for other companies. And if you look at our website in the near future, you will at least see how that this particular prototype and product have grown to uh, create an entire industry branch uh, uh, worldwide. And uh, uh, if you uh, if you have Netflix at home, you can see uh, us on uh, Bill Nye. Saves the World. I don't know if you know that show. It's on Netflix, uh, season one, episode seven. Games, no cheat codes for reality. We've also done uh, the Google Tech Talk for the, the board of directors of Google. And um, yeah, we've been uh, all over the world with it. It's been a, a huge, uh, huge uh, success. But the, the main reason why it's successful is uh, through our motto. It needs to be effective, it needs to be fun to play, and it needs to be affordable. And that's basically uh, what we uh, design all our solutions for. And the cool thing is, it's also being, this is how it's being used in, uh, in hospitals. It also uh, uh, is being used by a lot of nurses that want to become surgeons. Uh, that's actually one of our main target audiences. Thank you.